следващият ни кост лектор. А, преди официално да обявя неговото име, неговата тема, а бих искал да ви кажа, че той ще проведе своята лекция на английски, тъй като не е българин. А, е и напел към всички вас, които а, иска да му зададат въпроси. Задайте ги въпросите направо на английски, просто за да може да избегне момента, в който може да се а, объркаме в превода. И да, да не му ги зададем коректно, тъй като всеки един домен си има своите особености. И така, нека да преминем а, към следващия ни гост лектор. А, неговото име е Олег Мирошник, който ще ни разкаже за Fast is Best using .NET Minimal API. Той е Senior Software Developer с повече от 15 години опит. Основно се фокусира в Document and Enterprise Content Management домейна, но разработва и част от приложенията си за социалните медии и healthcare. Hi Oleg and welcome in our stage. Hi Oleg. Hi. Hello. Hello. Uh, I hope you're well. Uh, we are very glad that uh, we, we have also speakers from other countries and I hope we will learn uh, a great new things from, from you. Uh, yeah, now uh, I can just say, you know, um, we, we are leaving with Radus. The stage is yours and we will see you again in the Q&A section. Good luck, Oleg. Thank you. Thank you much. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Oleg Mirojnik. I'm a principal software developer at Sigma Software. And today I'd like to talk about uh, .NET Minimal API. Uh, actually, Mikhail already introduced me, so I'm more than uh, 15 years uh, in software development industry. Uh, my primary focus is the document enterprise content management areas. However, a few years before, I took a part in development of social media and healthcare software. Uh, so we just a bit tied on time, uh, so uh, I'd like uh, to introduce the agenda for today's talk. Uh, so we will have a quite a brief introduction to the .NET Minimal APIs, what it is. And then uh, we will switch uh, to the practical part, so we will code uh, today, uh, and we implement uh, a uh, REST HTTP API for demo project. Uh, that's actually the API for um, public transport uh, printed machine, ticket spending machine, uh, clients uh, that uh, could issue tickets in public transport. So uh, yeah, during the analysis phase, uh, we define the requirements, uh, we define the resources uh, that we deal with, uh, we also build the resource hierarchy and uh, just uh, define an API, API endpoints that we will implement. Uh, yeah, so and we will call to the API endpoints that uh, give us the ability to list the available tickets that passengers could buy. Uh, we just simulate the, the ordering of the tickets and issuing of the tickets and also implement the validators uh, for issued tickets. Uh, well, so what is .NET Minimal APIs? Uh, it's just an alternative way uh, to develop uh, the Microsoft uh, microservices and HTTP APIs uh, that was introduced by Microsoft uh, to make uh, things a bit simpler. That's because it takes its origins in 2007 uh, when Microsoft releases the ASP.NET MVC framework uh, that was an alternative way for developing web applications uh, to the web forms that was exists and exists and actually currently. However, MVC was uh, much more uh, lightweight and uh, highly testable framework if compared to the web forms. Then in 2012, Microsoft uh, releases uh, ASP.NET Web API framework. That's just uh, the separate framework that borrows many concepts uh, from the ASP.NET MVC. However, its primary focus was uh, develop um, production of the .NET uh, based HTTP APIs. In 2016, uh, Microsoft releases ASP.NET Core uh, that uh, just combines these two frameworks, MVC and Web API, into the one cross-platform framework uh, for building both web applications and APIs. So we might think, why do we need the .NET Minimal APIs? Actually, the reason is uh, that uh, ASP.NET MVC requires um, uh, following some kind of ceremony. So basically, you just need uh, to know uh, many, maybe not so many uh, things uh, before you can start with uh, the development. And uh, it just uh, rises the enter barrier for the new developers, for example. Or if you want to implement something simple, you still have to 
uh, follow the conquest ceremony and uh, add maybe some extra code in order to implement it. And we just can comp compare a Hello World example. And so basically, this is just uh, an application that uh, when requested the Hello World endpoint, it just returns Hello World string. Uh, so both um, code snippets uh, from the left and from the right uh, just does absolutely the same thing. However, uh, on the left, we will see the controller-based API. Mm, so as you can see, you just need to uh, know uh, how to implement the controllers, uh, which base class should be used uh, for controller to be to inherit. Also, you need to know uh, about attributes that you will use to wrap your code. Uh, and uh, if you just take a look at the code on the right, it's uh, just much more simpler and it's uh, just uh, and point to that minimal API endpoint. Uh, for those uh, who just worked with the Node.js, you could probably see uh, where Microsoft probably took its inspiration uh, while implementing this uh, .NET minimal APIs uh, support. Uh, well, uh, the question could be that uh, would it be possible that .NET minimal APIs will completely substitute uh, the controller-based APIs that uh, was before? Uh, or not. Uh, so that's just the site of Damien Edwards. Uh, he is principal for lead manager architect on the .NET team at Microsoft, and uh, he is responsible for uh, supporting and maintaining ASP.NET Core. And he says that uh, they don't have plan, plans uh, to deprecate the controllers. Uh, however, they think that uh, maybe 80 to 90 percent of uh, scenarios uh, could be covered with the .NET minimal APIs. So basically, they just want to simplify uh, a bit life of the developers who deals uh, with the APIs or implements the HTTP based API, APIs. And he also states that uh, in some cases uh, we should follow the ceremony that I mentioned before. And uh, actually, it provides a lot of power that uh, may be not uh, needed um, in uh, many cases. And uh, for sure, the framework is uh, quite mature. It just has various uh, set of filters. It supports build and validation. It is not uh, supported um, in uh, .NET minimal APIs. However, in .NET 7, there are some improvements on that matter. And, uh, uh, yeah, you can benefit from them as well. And probably .NET minimal APIs will evolve more and more, uh, while the controller-based API it seems that uh, in terms of performance, uh, the Microsoft team just reached the barrier uh, of performance optimization, so the controller-based API. Uh, well, so let's talk about the demo project that we are going to implement today. As I mentioned before, it's uh, just HTTP, uh, REST HTTP API for um, public transport uh, tickets vending machines. Um, so, and uh, actually it would allow uh, passengers uh, to choose and see the available tickets that could be bought. A passenger can choose the required amount of tickets, uh, order these tickets, uh, and uh, then it is possible to validate these tickets. So now I'll just open a client application uh, that is wired up to uh, implemented HTTP API. So basically we can buy a few tickets. Uh, you will see the bot tickets in our UI. It's just an imaginary uh, validator device uh, that uh, where we can just put the QR code and see that ticket is valid or not. Uh, and, uh, and so basically we will implement HTTP REST HTTP API for this client application. So now I'll close the implemented API. So we will see that now our client application doesn't have a connection point where it could fetch the data. Uh, well, uh, brief talk about the tickets. Uh, so it's always nice uh, when you can uh, re replicate uh, some kind of um, application uh, that uh, provides benefits to people. And by staying in Warsaw, uh, I just decided to replicate uh, the Warsaw public transport uh, tickets uh, within machines, uh, user interface and functionality using this uh, and present on uh, today's demo. And in Warsaw, uh, there are three groups, uh, main groups of tickets that you can buy at, uh, by entering the vehicle. It's a single car tickets and uh, two types of transfer tickets. Uh, the city is divided uh, by zones. Zone one is just the main city zone, and zone two is just uh, city boundaries. 
And uh, some of tickets are valid uh, in particular zones, some of tickets are valid in both zones. Uh, all tickets have uh, the uh, validity period of time in minutes. Uh, so first group is uh, 20 minutes, the second group is 75 minutes, and uh, third group is 90 minutes. Additionally, tickets, uh, single four tickets doesn't allow you to, to have transfers between the transport. For example, if you bought the, this ticket in uh, one uh, vehicle, you cannot use it in another one. However, the transfer tickets allows uh, to use that approach. And uh, all tickets just divided into two groups. So it's just a regular price ticket and a reduced price ticket uh, for seniors or kids, for example. Uh, well, let's define the requirements uh, for our uh, application and uh, our HTTP API backend. Uh, so, as a passenger, when I enter a public transport vehicle, I want to see, choose, and order tickets at vending machine. As a vending machine, I want to, pro to process passengers' order, so I can request authority to issue the ordered tickets and print them. And uh, as a validator, I want to verify uh, the passenger's ticket's uh, validity status, so I can check whether the passengers uh, has the right to use or enter the transport. So, as you can see, uh, we highlighted the nouns in uh, this uh, set of requirements, which basically could be transformed or just represented uh, the resources of the, our API that we deal with. Because if we just um, refer to the REST architecture style, so REST is uh, represented representation of state transfer, and it's just an architectural style for designing loosely coupled uh, applications over the network, uh, and uh, they are often uh, used in development of uh, web services. And uh, these REST architectural styles uh, has six main uh, constraints. Uh, so it's just a uniform interface uh, that uh, guides uh, us uh, how to organize the, uh, the resources that we deal with. Uh, the format, data format that is used to, to communicate uh, between client and uh, server application. Uh, also, the resource uh, should be um, separated from its representation. So that's basically uh, could be achieved uh, by using the HTTP uh, protocol uh, capabilities. Uh, so the resource identifier is the URL that we use uh, to access it or to communicate with it. And, uh, and the resources representation could be the response or request body that represents a particular resource. It's also client-server uh, constraint, uh, so basically the client and server application should be evolved independently. It's cacheable, uh, basically it could, caching could be done on uh, server or client side. And, uh, partially it can be handled uh, by using the HTTP capabilities. It uh, should be stateless, so each request uh, should contain uh, the full set of information for being processed uh, by the server. Uh, and, uh, endpoint on the server side. So no session preservance between the requests uh, should be uh, introduced in that case. The layered system uh, basically tells that uh, client application shouldn't know whether it's uh, directly connected to the server or there are some intermediaries between them. It could be, for example, load balancer. And uh, the sixth uh, optional constraint is the call on demand, uh, which means that uh, it's allowed uh, to return uh, some uh, code parts uh, from server to the client to extend the client's capabilities. For example, it could be a kind of uh, UI templates for Angular application, some, uh, whatever. Um, well, how can we build uh, the um, resources, uh, endpoints, uh, resource URLs to our endpoints? One of the possible ways is just uh, to collect the resources. So as you can see, I just uh, on the list on the left is just highlighted nouns that we deal with because we, each noun usually represents a particular resource that we deal with. However, some uh, processes can also be transformed into the resources. For, for example, approve document action could be transformed in a document approval resource. And uh, since, uh, for example, ticket, vehicle, and uh, validator, and order, uh, they cannot be just built into the hierarchy because ticket is not belonging to the vehicle, for example. So it belongs to some authority that managed, uh, manages the public transport. Uh, so for that purpose, I just introduced the, the authority route element 
authority root resource. Um, it could also be like API version, uh, presented by API version, like V1 authority, for example. And then we just uh, build the hierarchy that uh, tickets are part of authority. So authority just defines uh, which tickets uh, to issue and uh, which tickets could be accepted um, by uh, public transport vehicles. Uh, it's also a, a set of vehicles. Uh, it could be trains, buses, so the various kind of vehicles. So we just use the plural form uh, since we just return more resources than one. And if you just need to, to return one resource, you can proceed to this uh, endpoint just with the ID parameter, for example. Validators, basically, it could be automatic entrance gates, uh, it could be inspectors that just go over the transport and validate the tickets uh, for the passengers, and orders uh, to collect information about the ordered uh, tickets by particular passengers. And when your machines are installed inside of public transport vehicle, mm, that's why you just uh, listed resource of vehicles. And uh, here's just an order resource. Uh, it's uh, this endpoint will accept uh, passengers' orders. So we would be receiving part of the information of each kind of tickets and in which amount passengers wants to buy them. And uh, ticket status uh, resource, uh, it's just a nested item of validators. Uh, it's just a ticket validation process that uh, transformed to the resource. So basically, validate ticket action transformed to the ticket status. So basically, we just query in ticket status and receiving it. Well, and uh, then we can just uh, build the URIs to our resources uh, by following the hierarchy that we discussed before. As you can see, it has uh, the ID vehicles because passengers buy the ticket at particular rented machine in particular vehicle. So that's why we just need these identifiers. And uh, we also um, use the HTTP capabilities to express our APIs uh, with the HTTP verbs. So basically, uh, for uh, getting the uh, set of tickets that would be rendered on the client uh, application's UI, we just call get authority tickets. And in body, we will return the array of JSON objects that represent the tickets that passengers could buy. However, if we just put in an order, passengers places an order, we just provide information from passenger to our uh, HTTP uh, backend, and we will use the post HTTP verb for that purpose. The same happens uh, to validator uh, ticket status. Uh, so basically, we just providing the issue ticket and uh, getting the results. Uh, so since we provide the data, we use post. And uh, also for authority orders to fetch information about the passenger's order uh, and to render the tickets on the client UI, we will use the get HTTP verb and authority orders. So let's briefly talk about the data structures uh, that we will use to represent the ticket. And so basically to represent the ticket that uh, we stated before, we need a stop keeping unit property. It's just a kind of ID uh, of the ticket. It's just unique for a particular ticket. It also contains information about the ticket kind, so it could be regular or reduced. Uh, it has a flag that uh, indicates uh, whether the transfer is allowed or not. Um, contains information about the validity zones where the ticket is valid, validity period and minutes, and price and local currency. So by having this data, we can represent the ticket. In, uh, on, on, on the ticket vending machine client application. So the next uh, is the tickets order endpoint that we will implement. Mm, so in addition to the providing the resource URL, we also provide in a request body information about the order items. So basically just array of pairs of SQ of the ticket in quantity. And as a response, we just return the, again, we will use the HTTP uh, capabilities uh, which are just HTTP status code that indicates what happens on the server side to inform the client about the accurate action. So we will return the response code 201, uh, which will be created. We also provide in the location header information about the path to the address of the resource uh, by which uh, client application could fetch information about the passenger's order. 
And also we just uh, provide information about the issue ticket. So basically just based uh, with the part that we discussed on the previous step, however, it will be extended with two additional fields, uh, issued date time and uh, issued vehicle ID. Orders in point uh, just returns uh, exactly the same information for a particular order for about the issue tickets. And uh, ticket status in point uh, returns, uh, accepts the issue ticket data and just returns uh, Depending on the validity status, the code fail it. It would be HTTP status code okay or bad request HTTP status code 400 with the message, validation message. Additionally, since we just emulate in the validator device, we just need to provide uh, additional information from validator. Like, so we can manipulate with the date time, with the vehicles and zones in which uh, we just going to verify the tickets. Well, uh, now it's time to code. So I just uh, have semi-prepared uh, project uh, for that purpose. Uh, basically, it's uh, pretty similar when you start uh, the empty uh, .NET Minimal API project. However, I just already added uh, the memory cache. It's a built-in uh, cache uh, for in uh, .NET, uh, so we can use it, uh, and we will use it uh, for store information about the orders. Well, in real life, it could be a database, maybe some files, or maybe uh, uh, other services. And uh, I just registering the validators uh, that we will use uh, since .NET 7 doesn't have built-in support of validators, so I will show how can we go this problem around. Uh, so let's start. Uh, instead of authority, I just decided to, to use uh, today's uh, PubDev uh, conference uh, name. So well, that will be authority for that purpose. And uh, as you can see, <clears throat> well, def is duplicated. We just replicated for each uh, endpoint. Mm. In .NET 6, uh, with which the .NET minimal API was initially uh, released, uh, there wasn't capability to group it somehow. Uh, so you have uh, always to replicate or just replicate the information about the prefixes, static prefixes, for example, or common prefixes uh, for your endpoints into one group. And however, in .NET 7, mm, there is a, a group, uh, endpoint groups, uh, just row groups uh, just implemented. So let's use it. So to extract the common part of uh, our endpoints uh, resource uh, URLs, we can uh, call map group. And here we just provide. That's it. So now, uh, if we deal and uh, map our uh, roles to the handlers, uh, we don't have to replicate this prefix. So first thing that we just need to implement is just the tickets and points. So it's just quite, quite basic. So we can say that authority and we are ready to respond to the get HTTP verb uh, that HTTP method uh, and uh, that uh, points to the tickets and points. Oops. We can just say implement it as an empty one and ju just check that uh, our point response and so i just prepared the postman sample requests so we can do the request and we'll see that empty response returned and uh, status code is 200 which means that we just responded uh well first thing that we need to do is uh, just uh, to implement the data structure uh, that represents the ticket that the passengers could buy i use uh, code snippets to speed uh, the development up not uh, to waste uh, your time and so we can uh, implement everything in time so basically just structure that we discussed it represents queue kind transfers allowed validity zones previous minutes and local currency and we also need to implement a ticket kind reduced numeration that's it so now we can uh, operate with the data structure. Uh, however, if we just want uh, in uh, JSON uh, uh, enumerates uh, be serialized uh, as a names instead of values, uh, we need to use uh, one configuration step. Uh, so to do so, we can uh, call the builder services configure HTTP JSON option. This is just a new method uh, in .NET 7, uh, and it was introduced uh, to uh, 
fix the mismatch problem with the JSON options because if you just take a look at JSON options, uh, they are exist uh, exists in uh, two namespaces, different namespaces, and this is just uh, completely different classes. So if you use uh, the JSON options uh, not from the valid class or not from the valid namespace, now you your um, configuration will not be applied because before and still it's possible configure and here you can provide JSON options. Uh, so to fix this means means much in .NET 7 Microsoft introduced uh, this method and here in options we just can configure the serializer options and we need to add the converter which is JSON string and converter. So after that, enumerations uh, will be serialized uh, in the representation of uh, enum names instead of values. So that's it. Uh, what we need uh, else, uh, we need uh, some kind of service that provides us uh, with the information about the tickets. And so for that purpose, uh, let's implement this ticket service. Mm -hmm. this, okay, here it is. Uh, basically, we store the information about uh, tickets in memory. Uh, so I just uh, prepared the code snippet that initializes the collection of tickets that uh, that work list. So we will implement the two necessary methods for us. First one uh, is that returns all the tickets uh, that are defined in uh, our service here. So this is just the six tickets that we discussed before. And another one, is get by sq it could be get by id and uh, this uh, method should return the single ticket uh, with the id or sq number that uh, equals to the provided sq number that's it our service is ready and now we just need to wire this service uh, to our api uh, endpoint uh, how to do so? For sure, we can just call new ticket service here, uh, instantiate the ticket service and uh, use it. Uh, however, U is glue, uh, basically. So, uh, by our employee should be responsible for managing the lifetime of the dependent object, uh, so of the object that it depends on. Uh, for that purpose, uh, the minimal API is just inherited by powerful and quite uh, well proven uh, dependency injection mechanism uh, from the ASP.NET core. And uh, to register our instance uh, in the service collection and to benefit from dependency injection mechanism <coughs> in .NET, um, .NET Core, we just need to register our services. Um, to do so, we uh, can uh, use the helper methods uh, that uh, could register our instance. So, for example, I just used a singleton which means that we are just uh, registering uh, our uh, service uh, in the collection of the services and uh, we define its lifetime uh, to be the same as like application lifetime. So between the different requests, the same instance of ticket service will be returned um, by the dependency injection mechanism. It's also possible to use add scope, uh, which means uh, that uh, the same instance the scope of one request uh, will be returned uh, of the registered service. And uh, the third option is add tranching, uh, which means uh, that the ticket service, uh, new ticket service instance or service instance will be returned uh, with each request uh, to dependency injection mechanism. So basically, we don't modify anything here and uh, we just only read the data, which is static uh, in our application. So it would be okay to use the add single run. So after we registered the ticket service, we can benefit. Uh, from it and you can use in our endpoint to use it. We just should define it as a parameter of our API endpoint. And we can uh, return uh, the data about our <coughs> tickets. Mm. So we can call ticket service, get all. However, uh, one thing uh, is uh, that in that case, <coughs> framework will automatically put the 200 OK response code and return the ticket data as a JSON. Actually, that is what exactly we needed. However, in some cases, you just need uh, to um, reuse or to give more control. For example, created uh, response uh, should also uh, contain information in location header. 
For this purpose, uh, framework provides us with the results helper class that has helper methods that just uh, contains uh, the commonly used uh, responses uh, with this uh, additional structure. You, by, by the way, you can extend this uh, results collection uh, with your own implementation. And so for that purpose, you should uh, make extension method for high result extensions, and then you can just access these results extensions. And in the .7 uh, to improve the unit testing capabilities, uh, there is a typed results uh, class was uh, added with the same set of method. However, they just return the typed uh, results, and uh, which are beneficial for those who just use the unit testing or cover API with the unit tests. So uh, we just implemented our endpoint. And we can just uh, call our ticket point here, and we will see that the response. And we see that our enumeration just uh, serialized and regular reduced instead of zero and one. And we just can get back to our client application, and we see that uh, just we now we see that a set of tickets are present. However, we cannot buy them yet because we didn't implement the order endpoint. So that, that's uh, the next uh, what we do. So again, to authority, so we don't need to <coughs> specify the pull that prefix as authority prefix. And uh, we copy it uh, in the machine order. That's it. So endpoint. And as you can see, Rider highlighted me uh, segments that could be dynamic. So they just uh, wrapped in the curly braces, which means that uh, our endpoint will respond to, to the uh, resources, uh, that, to the routes uh, that uh, these uh, parts uh, could differ. However, it should conform to the vehicles and then some, some URL segment or road segment. And it could be dynamic, then again uh, literal, uh, road literal, and then again road value, and again road literal. So this allows us uh, to execute the same endpoint uh, even by having different vehicles ID or vending machines ID. And uh, let's assume that vehicle ID and vending machine ID would be an integers. So let's just uh, define this variable. Let me copy just not to mistake with the thing. That's it. Okay, so uh, how the parameters from this segment uh, would uh, be passed uh, to the, for example, parameters of our endpoint handler? Uh, let minimal APIs just borrows the model binion uh, mechanism uh, from the ASP.NET Core. Uh, so it's quite a powerful thing. And uh, we also could use the constraints. So basically, if we <clears throat> just uh, restart our API and uh, try to send uh, requests, you will see that response is OK. However, uh, we defined that uh, ID is integer, but client could provide some string, for example. And in that case, we will see the exception here. So we will see the bad request. Uh, routing in it in a core is powerful, as I said. And so we can constrain it to the integer data type, for example. That's it, and if you restart the API and try to do the test request to the vending machine, we will see that not found endpoint. That's because this part is not corresponding to the integer data type. So if you just provide one, two, three, four, you again get an uh, OK response. Additionally, we can even uh, specify the minimum value. Uh, minimum, it could be possible to specify the minimum length. So basically, you can refer to the ASP.NET routing uh, documentation to get. Uh, the full set of constraints that uh, can be consumed by you in order to um, validate or maybe not validate, but uh, adjust your endpoints. So that's it. Uh, another thing that we need is the information about the um, some data structure that represents uh, the passenger's order. Uh, I just already prepared it. Uh, so we have the order request class uh, that uh, contains the collection of order items, and each order item is just a pair of uh, ticket skew and quantity. Uh, so just to receive it, 
we can provide for the request. So that's it. Uh, basically, these two parameters will be fetched uh, from the road because they are defined in the road. And then, uh, if uh, order request is not specified as a road parameter, then uh, <clears throat> the system will try to fetch the information from uh, body request body. Uh, however, you can also just adjust uh, where would you like to fetch it. Could be from body, from form, from query, from route, from services. Uh, so. You can also refer to the documentation uh, to get more information how to control uh, the model BD in your reports. Uh, what else uh, do we need? We need the ticket service just to fetch the information about the ticket the passengers want to buy because we just provided only a SKU number and uh, no other details. And uh, we will use uh, cache to store our order. Okay. That's it. Uh, so uh, let's introduce the data structure that represents our order. Ah, additional thing that we need to, to provide the issued ticket. Basically, it just inherits uh, from ticket. It has copy and constructor and extended these two fields, uh, issued date time and issued vehicle ID. Uh, so let's uh, implement our order. So what else do we need? We just need to enumerate over the order request order items. Uh, here we just need to fetch information about our ticket. So we can call our ticket as get by SKU order item number. So here we just get information about the ticket. And now we also need to enumerate over the quantity. As a person could, passengers could buy more than one ticket, for example. Six. And here we just issue our ticket. So issue mechanism would be quite simple. We will use issue ticket based on tickets info. We fetched before, however, it will be extended uh, with the issue date time, which is date time, current date time, and issued vehicle ID. Vehicle ID is our parameter here, so it's a part of uh, its road value. And we need to add the information about the issued ticket to our order. Now, when we issued all the tickets, uh, we need to store the order information in cache. So it's, uh, we just need also some kind of order ID. We will use GUID for that purpose. That's it. So in cache, the key will be order ID, information about the order. So we just add it only, just not to be modifiable. And here we just specify um, how uh, cache should store the information. So one minute should be enough for our purposes. And we just need to return the created result. So results created. And here we will see that uh, created uh, helper method uh, provide, uh, guides us to provide the URI to the created resource, uh, basically to the order endpoint. So we don't have uh, order information endpoint. Uh, so we just use this stuff and we provide the order information as a response in the response body. So that's it. Now let's execute uh, the Google API and try to execute. So we're just going to buy two tickets uh, by sending the valid request. So you see that two tickets just returned. Uh, however, in headers, we will have stop. And uh, actually, we cannot buy tickets yet because we didn't provide the valid uh, resource URL uh, in our location header that our client application relies on. <clears throat> Uh, why this could be necessary? <clears throat> and, uh, because uh, you, API should be as much so descriptive as it could, and also REST as a, uh, some term like uh, Hypermedia as, a, as an engine of application state, so it should provide information about the resources it, and related resources that are returned with particular response. Mm -hmm. So the API can adjust, adjust itself and uh, just do some uh, requests uh, without even changing on the client side. 
to basically do the changes on the server side, but client side is not affected. So let's just uh, do few uh, public uh, orders. Stop order at some point. So priority hit. Yeah. No. We should probably agree to order ID. And uh, to use the reference to our endpoint, uh, we can use this name of the order. Uh, this uh, just a metadata for our endpoint that can be consumed uh, <clears throat> in uh, other points to, to obtain the link to the valid resource. And so to use uh, this mechanism, we should inject link generator. This is just uh, a class uh, built in .NET, uh, in .NET 7 and uh, it's registered automatically, so we don't have to register the collection of the services. Uh, and to use it, we can get my a path by name. So basically, we just get path to our endpoint uh, by using the name. So now we can the order. And also, we need to provide information about the parameter. So basically, it's just order ID parameter for us. So that's it. And now we can use the generated. Link to our endpoint. So if I everything made correctly, we should see the header link to our orders endpoint, as you can see. So let's uh, quickly implement this endpoint. We can also constrain the order ID to greet uh, data from, and uh, also we need the cache to fetch the information from cache. cache. And if we try to get value by order ID, and we know that it's just a enumerable ticket, it's order information. So if, if it was fetched, uh, then we can empty the cache um, by that key. So we just need the order information only once and return OK results. And this is our order information here. Otherwise, if uh, the data is not found, we can return the found results. That's it. <clears throat> yeah, so now if we just uh, do a request, we see uh, information about our order, and we can try to fetch information about the created order here. <clears throat> As you can see, we get information about the order, but if we just do the second time, we will see that not found because we emptied the cache after the first request. Uh, another thing, uh, since the uh, .NET minimal API doesn't support or doesn't have a built-in validation mechanism, for example, there is a case uh, when uh, passenger could provide by some hacking uh, negative quantity. And in that case, we will issue one ticket, however, we should uh, respond with uh, <clears throat> some validation problem. To do so, uh, there is a good uh, validation, uh, third party validation uh, <clears throat> package. It is called Fluent Validation. Uh, it's intended to validate the different kinds of data. And uh, it's widely used actually in uh, API development, HTTP API development in .NET. <clears throat> and also, we just need uh, to add dependency injection extensions of the Fluent Validation that would allow us uh, to easily register the validators. Uh, so basically, this helper method is provided by these dependency in, in, injection extensions package, uh, which it states that we can specify the type as a marker uh, by which the uh, helper method will identify the assembly in uh, which needs to be scanned uh, for defined validators that implements uh, the fluent validation base validator and uh, register them as a, in service collections. And after that, you can just benefit from dependency injection mechanism and uh, <clears throat> use these validators. So to implement this uh, kind of validators in the fluent validation, we need to create a class that inherits uh, from the abstract validator, which is just a part of fluent validation library. 
and uh, as a generic type parameter, we just need to, to provide the information which uh, kind of object we are going to validate. After that, we just define the constructor. And uh, I just uh, use the code snippet. Validation loops. Uh, where in constructor, you, by calling the helper method provided by the base class, uh, specify the expressions that are going to validate uh, for uh, validation logic. You can provide validation logic for them and also the messages in case if uh, validation error occurs. Also, I just added a row level cascade mode to stop, which means that if at least one validation error occurs, uh, the validation process stops and uh, false validation result is returned by validation library. However, it's uh, also possible and actually it's defined default values to continue. So basically the whole set of rules will be executed on object uh, and uh, then uh, the uh, compound validation uh, result will be created. May mostly it's usable, for example, if you just need a kind of mechanism that provides the validation summary for particular form. So to, to, to validate our order request, you know, all that we need to do after that, after we implemented our validator, uh, just inject it as a parameter. After that, now you can just the validation result and we call validator validate methods and we can provide our order request here. And here we just need to check whether the validation result is valid or not. And if it's not valid, let's uh, return uh, results uh, validation problem. Again, this is just a helper method that uh, uses the standard way how the validation problems are returned. And uh, as a parameter, it just requires the errors uh, dictionary. And the fluent validation uh, provides a different helper method that transform our validation result to dictionary. So after that, when we just try to provide the negative skew number, you can see that validation logic works uh, fine. And if, for example, we didn't specify the skew number, you will see that ticket SQ is not specified. So now we can get, get back to our, our client application. We can order a few tickets here. You will see that they just rendered uh, in our imaginary validator device. And as you can see, we cannot validate them yet because we didn't implement the validation endpoint. So actually, uh, the validation endpoint uh, consumes uh, the same uh, approach uh, as uh, we did with validation in order request. Uh, so I just uh, use the code snippet. Tickets. Tickets. Point this one, and what we need to do is just authority. Uh, also, uncommend the ticket status validator. So, basically, it's again the validator that implements the abstract validator class and a set of rules to validate the tickets. Uh, the purpose. Uh, one extra thing that I'd like to show you uh, if uh, we get back to information about our additional parameters you can see that date time vehicle id and zone should be provided as a get uh, as a request query um, parameters uh, however we will not define them here yet uh, you can specify three additional parameters here and uh, specify the from query decorate them uh, from query attribute however uh, in .NET minimal api uh, you can use the binding uh, model binding uh, adjustments that can, you can implement and consolidate in a particular class. Well, so I decided to encapsulate it into the validator data params and uh, data structure. So basically that it contains the current date time, uh, vehicle ID and so on. Exactly the same information that we are providing here, date time, vehicle ID and so on. Uh, to fetch this information uh, right away without uh, adding more and more parameters, uh, in the that minimal API, you can use uh, the uh, bind async method, uh, which should be static. So basically, you should follow the rules uh, in order to benefit from this uh, by model binding uh, mechanism in the that minimal APIs. So in your class, you should define the public status uh, bind async method that accepts uh, the HTTP context and parameter info parameters of the HTTP context parameter, and it should return value task uh, with the parameter that 
should conform to your class, defined class. And here you just get a kind of low level access uh, to the context request. So as you can see, I just uh, query the DT, the ID, and the Z uh, parameters from query that just uh, stores the information about current time, vehicle ID. And then I just create in uh, my um, validator data parameters data structure that we are returning. And then we can consume it in our endpoint handler here. Uh, so, and if you run our application, we can do the test request uh, with the postman just to see that it's just an expiry ticket here. And uh, now we can refresh and uh, check our solution that it works. So I just put tickets of different types. For example, single fire ticket, it's valid. If we switch the zone, it's valid. If we switch the vehicle, it says that the transfers are not allowed. For example, if you try to validate the result, uh, reduced ticket, uh, it's uh, valid with ID. It allows the transfers. However, if we switch the different zone, it just says that it's not valid in current zone. Uh, the third uh, kind of ticket, so basically it's uh, valid in both zones, it allows transfers, uh, so we can just check that it's valid. Uh, however, we can just check that expiration time is 512, so let's simulate that it's 520. There it is, we see that the ticket is expired. So that's uh, probably it uh, that I wanted to, to demonstrate you today. Uh, so please ask questions if you have any. Hi, Oleg. Uh, thank you very much for this lecture. It was very cool that uh, we had a live demo. So thank you. Thank you very much uh, for that. Uh, actually, we're moving forward with time and won't have enough time for the questions, but uh, you can stay and answer in the comment sections if there are any. Yeah, sure, sure. And I'd like uh, to mention that my goal was uh, just to show how simple to start with, and I hope that I just inspired uh, the guys uh, to try it and just not to afraid to use the API. And it's, I'm glad that it was a kind of a real life example. So I hope that uh, my lecture was helpful. Yeah, the example was great. Demo was great, definitely. And what I can say, hope to hope to see you again. Uh, why not in the next conference with another interesting topic? Okay, yeah, yeah, I'll, I'll get to, to be a speaker as well, yeah, on the next. And thank you very much.